Today is Jay Curtis's birthday, my father. Born right in the middle of the 20th century, he would have been 72 today had ALS not taken him from us back in January of 2018. My history of rock followers will probably remember him as the annoying hippie bum, which was just a one-off joke Nick and I came up with in the 50s episode, which he absolutely committed to. But he was also the original director, coming at it with decades of directing experience from David Caruso, Chuck Norris, even Bill Cosby. Yeah, remind me to tell you that story sometime. But he turned the crappy equipment we had into something with unique lighting, framing, and shaped Nick and I into giving our best performances. Why don't you do it one more time, and then at the end, Great Balls of Fire, and leave it to Beaver? <laughs> When we got to the 60s episode, I was chatting with him about everything from Ed Sullivan to Woodstock, which he experienced firsthand and still had crystal clear memories of. Believe me, I'd been hearing these stories my entire life. So I told him, why don't you just come on and talk about it? And since we'd already introduced him as the bum, why not have him continue as the character? Seemed like a funny idea, but the experiences he talked about were all real. And honestly, I'm so thankful I got him on recording talking about it, because shortly afterwards he began to lose his voice from ALS, so his stories are forever documented. The thing is, he had a lot more to say when we did voiceovers. I had to cut it way down for time, obviously. So since it's his birthday, I decided to upload the entire interview with him. And one funny thing you'll note is that he starts this off in character using his annoying hippie bum voice, but then as he gets going, it slowly morphs into his normal voice, so I always thought that was kind of funny when I was listening to it again. Anyway, here's his recollections on seeing the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show. I remember that the Beatles were going to be on the Ed Sullivan Show, and everybody was talking about it, and my sisters were all excited about it because they loved the Beatles. But I didn't really like the Beatles too much. I saw them on the Jack Parr show. They had a little film of them. And I thought, those guys look like girls. I don't understand it. And then we were all sitting around the living room. And I was like, yeah, I want to watch something else. And the Beatles came on. And suddenly I went, oh, my God. And they were incredible. And they played a couple of songs. And then later in the show, they played another couple of songs. And I was hooked. From then on, I was a Beatles fan. I went out and I bought Meet the Beatles. I listened to every Beatles song. And on the radio, it was Beatles, Beatles, Beatles. They had Beatle double plays. They played two Beatles songs. The Beatles had five songs in the top ten. They were unbelievable. And I was crazy about them. And then, where am I? Oh, yeah, the Beatles. I love the Beatles. What was it about the Beatles performance of the Ed Sullivan show specifically that's so, why is it so fondly remembered? I think it's fondly remembered because so many people watched it and um, it was an event. It was one of the first events on television. And unfortunately, the big event that had happened before that was the shooting of President Kennedy. And there was so much negativity and it was like the world was coming to an end. And then all of a sudden, the Beatles were like a light at the end of the tunnel. Like, here came these guys from Liverpool. And they were so professional. They played, they sang, they sang harmonies. They were totally different than anything else. And they played live. They weren't just standing there mouthing the words. And they all played their instruments really well. And the girls were going crazy. And if you were a young boy at that time, you thought, hey... I want to be a rock and roll star. That way I get all the girls. I was mesmerized from the very moment, the very first song they did, which I think was All My Lovin'. And Paul sang it. And it was just like the coolest thing I had ever heard. And I always loved that song. I like that song better than I Want to Hold Your Hand or She Loves You or any of the other songs. It just was an amazing song. And now comes his Woodstock story. You cannot imagine how many times I heard about this over the years. Well, imagine it's 1969, and I'm 19 years old. And three of my friends come to me and go, you know what? They're going to have some kind of music art festival up in New York somewhere. And uh, we should go. And we can get tickets. And we never got tickets. 
So four of us jumped in my friend's Volkswagen Beetle, and we started driving there. And when we got, this was like Thursday, and when we got to a certain point, the traffic was so jammed, we couldn't go any further. But my friend, because it was a Volkswagen Beetle, he just kept driving. He drove along the side of the road. He went across a farmer's field. He cut through here. He cut through there. And eventually, it was nighttime, and we parked the car, and the car was up on a hill, and it was pitch black. We fell asleep, and when we woke up in the morning, we looked down, and we were right behind the stage. And they were so stoned, the guys who were putting the stage together, that they never got the circular stage where they were supposed to put like three bands on this big platform and rotate, get them all set up and rotate one after the other and set up a new band. They never got that together. They never got the fences up. So then they said, oh, it's a free concert. So we didn't need the tickets. Anybody who had the tickets probably still has them. And then the show went on. What you can't understand from the movie and you don't see is that there was at least an hour or two between each act while they had to reset the stage. And we just would all kind of lay down on the ground, half a million people, and we would lay there until the next band came up. And at about four o'clock in the morning, Sly and the Family Stone came on and we all jumped up and sang, I want to take you higher. And it was incredible. And the Who came on and they played the entire Tommy uh, rock opera. And then at about eight o'clock in the morning, the Jefferson Airplane came on. So it was like around the clock and then it rained and it rained so hard and there was no place to go. And it was incredible. And I looked around at my friends, and we weren't really hippies. And I said, do you ever think there's something going on out there that we don't know anything about? And the thing went on, and it was dirty. And I remember being a college athlete, I I really wanted to take a shower. And so I got my soap and my towel, and I had cut-off shorts on, and I walked down to the stream, and there was a waterfall. And you could take a shower under the waterfall. And people were waiting online. And two people could stand on this rock under the waterfall and wash up. So I was waiting and I was standing next to this girl, this very pretty girl. And when it came time for us to get under the shower, she took off all of her clothes. I kept on my shorts and I stood there and I soaped myself up. And before that, I had thought, This hippie thing is so stupid. I don't understand it. I don't want to be any part of it. But when I was standing next to her and she was naked, I looked and I said, you know what? I think there's something to this hippie thing. I think I could be a hippie. This looks like a really good opportunity. Nothing happened at that point. But Woodstock changed everybody's minds. Everybody thought there's something different going on and I want to be a part of it. And after that, People on college campuses started dressing the way people did at Woodstock. It started a trend, and we listened to the music. I had never heard of Santana, but when they played at Woodstock, they stole the show, and I had to go out and get that Santana album. And I had to go out and get every album, except for The Grateful Dead. The middle of the afternoon, it was hot, and The Grateful Dead came on. And everybody stood up and started listening to them. And they went on and on and on. They did like 17-minute versions of very boring music. And before you knew it, everybody was back on the ground to sleep. Other than that, everything was great. I loved Woodstock. Woodstock changed history. It brought 400,000 people together. And they all looked at each other and said, Hey, this is like an army. We can do things. And when they left... They went off to their individual areas and they went off to their college campuses and they had a different idea. They had an idea of politics that was different. They had an idea of rock and roll that was different. And everything that came out of Woodstock changed the world. And there was, uh, was there drug use going on? There may have been drug use at Woodstock. I, you know, people were smoking marijuana and things. I don't really think I did any drugs at Woodstock. I really didn't smoke pot. Um, We got a case of beer, I think, and we drank that over the time. Most of the time it was warm. Uh, Other than that, I just, you were just high being there. 
you were just high being around these people. And everybody was looking out for each other. And they were serving food and they were changing history. And we all knew somehow that things were changing. And believe me, nobody had an iPhone to look at and say, oh, look what the newspapers are doing. Well, look what the local stations are doing. We had no idea what was going on on the outside. There was no contact with the outside world. So we were left on our own and we did a great job. There were no fights. There was no killings, unlike Altima. And listening back to this interview, I realized I had asked him the question, did the 60s rock hard, which for whatever reason we didn't end up using in the final video. Well, here's his answer to that question. There is more amazing music in the decade of the 60s than in any other decade. Things changed, things evolved, things fused, different kind of music came together from jazz to rock to folk to country. It all got together, and even Latin music became part of rock and roll. So yeah, the 60s were rock and roll, and rock and roll was the 60s. Happy birthday, Dad. I miss you, and thanks for all the memories. Now, there is only the gentle breeze. When the surf and sand fight for command, waiting with me patiently for our glorious